We are going through the book of Romans this year. And we are in a series that we're calling Break Every Chain. We're at the end of chapter five. And Romans five has some challenging verses in it. I would say, in fact, the second half of Romans five is probably the third most challenging text in the book of Romans to teach through. There's a lot here. What I don't wanna lose sight of at the beginning of this message is I believe what God wants, what I just prayed over our church family, is I believe he wants to set some people free. I believe he wants to break some chains. And so we're gonna dig into some verses that are pretty theological, pretty technical, like we'll do some teaching, but don't lose the heart of what this teaching is meant to accomplish in your life. It's meant to give you a confidence in Jesus as the chain breaker. So we're gonna talk about sin and where our sin story began with Adam and Eve and how we ended up where we are, but it's all meant to give you faith in Jesus, the only one who can set you free from the chains of the past. I had a lady tell me a number of years ago about her uncle and aunt who grew up in Louisville and lived their adult lives here in Louisville. Clay and Velma Likens were their names. Clay was a retired principal in Louisville. Velma was a retired school teacher. And in 1992, it was the night before Christmas that they stepped out on their front porch to turn off the Christmas lights and they noticed something sitting on the front part of their driveway. It was large, they went down there to investigate it. It was all wrapped in plastic. They unwrapped the thing at the end of the driveway and it was a wicker rocking chair. It took them a moment to place it it was a wicker rocking chair that had been stolen off of their front porch at that house 17 years earlier. <laughs> 17 years later, somebody had returned their wicker rocking chair and there was a note attached to it. Here's what the note said. To whom it may concern, approximately 13 to 17 years ago, my husband stole this wicker rocking chair from the front porch of this house. I'm ashamed of his behavior and I'm returning the stolen item. I have since been divorced from my husband and I've been born again. My life has completely changed and I want to undo any wrongdoing. I know this chair is not in the same condition as it was when it was stolen and I apologize. I now live in another state, Tennessee, and I'm rarely in this vicinity. I realize the cowardly fashion in which I'm returning this, but the reason is obvious. I will not bother you again. Please forgive us. 13 to 17 years later, she finds herself driving from Tennessee to Louisville with a wicker rocking chair in the back of a truck trying to make something right, trying to undo a wrong that had been done. I don't know of anyone who can't relate to what she was trying to accomplish in that moment. All of us know what that's like. We did something we don't like to think about it. In fact, sometimes the only way we can think about it is by getting angry and blaming somebody else for what happened. We did something and we wanna undo it, but it can't be undone. Or we said something and we wanna take it back, but it seems too late now. Or we didn't say something and we wish we would've, but now it seems too late. We missed our opportunity. Or we didn't do something and we should've, and, and now the weight of what we didn't do feels so heavy, it's always weighing us down and holding us back. It is the chain of regret and it follows us everywhere. And for some of you, you've been living with these chains so long that you don't even recognize it. It's a little bit like um, someone who might be in financial debt, so much financial debt for so long, they don't really know what it is to be free from that. So if and when they ever do get free, like it's, it's hard for them to know how to describe it. Like they've felt that weight for so long that they don't know what it's like to not have that weight. That's how some of you are with the chain of regret and the, shame of, and the chain of guilt and shame. You've pulled it with you through your whole life and you don't even know what it is to be free from it. It's just become normal. Or maybe it, that chain from the past is the chain of bitterness and anger because of what was done to you and it wasn't right and somebody owes you something. They owe you an explanation or they owe you a, a childhood or they owe you a marriage or they, they owe you an apology. They owe you something and you're just carrying that you owe me chain around with you everywhere you go and it, it's just become part of your life. 
And so how do we experience freedom from the past? Romans 5 is gonna help us understand the reality of our sin. We've already talked about it, but let's just hit it again from Romans 3, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All of us have a past. But where does the sin come from? What's the story of our sin? Romans 5 wants to help us understand how we ended up the way we ended up so that we can experience freedom. It takes us all the, way, all the way back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So Romans 5 verse 12, Paul explains the origin of sin. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world and Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. So everyone sinned. It's been well established in Romans. It's been uncomfortably clear in Romans that we've all sinned and we're all responsible for our own sin. But Romans 5 is using some language here to help us understand how we ended up this way. And the language it uses is virus language. Sin entered the world and it spread like a virus to everyone. Nobody was immune to it and it surfaces in our life in different ways. But it starts with Adam, sin entered the world and when sin entered the world, death spread to everyone. So Genesis chapter two and three tell us the story of that moment when sin, the virus came into the world. God says to, Abraham, or to, a, to Adam in verse 16, God says to Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it, you will surely die. First three words of this command, you are free. Like, don't let the enemy convince you that God's commands are too strict and too restrictive and that somehow he is wanting you to miss out on joy and peace. His command begins with, you're free. You're free. Now you can focus on the one command to not eat of the one tree or you can focus on the fact that you've been given all kinds of freedom to enjoy his good gifts in your life, but it starts with you, you are free. And there's this one tree that they can't eat from and that one tree gives them an option. It gives them a choice that they can choose God's way or they can choose their own way. Without that kind of freedom, then you can't really say there's, there's love. You can't really have a relationship if, it's, if there's not an option, if there's no choice to it. And, and so God says, look, here's the one thing that you are not to do. You're not to eat of this tree. But Adam and Eve, give in to their desires. They want the one thing that they're told they can't have. And, and Paul says, at that moment, sin entered the world like a virus and the curse of sin spread to everyone and everything. And verse 16 uses the word death, death spread. And, and in Genesis 2, that's what God said would happen. God said, look, if you eat of this tree, death. Now, when we hear the word death, we immediately connect it to just a physical dynamic, physical reality. But the word death in scripture, it means separation of two things. Separation of two things. Now we hear that and we translate it as separation of the body from the soul. And that certainly is true, physical death. But the death that is talked about here in Genesis is broader than just this physical death. It is that, but it's more than that. Francis Schaeffer talks about the five kinds of separation that was brought into the world through sin. He first talks about psychological separation, or I, I might call it emotional separation. But think of this as separation from yourself, from who God created you to be, who God wanted you to be in, when he first created mankind. It brought about this psychological separation. Genesis chapter three, verse seven says, then the eyes of both of them, this is after they sinned, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And so they experience shame and guilt for the first time. Imagine a reality without knowing what that felt like. Because for some of you, that's all you really know is that. This was the first time sin came into the world and they experience anxiety and insecurity, they're self-conscious. They have fear and they have frustration. They are dealing with disappointment and depression. So sin comes into the world and when it does, they experience this separation from themselves, the psychological separation. Francis Schaeffer also secondly talks about social separation, a social death that took place. 
that sin separates us from each other. Sin comes into the world, and what happens to Adam and Eve's relationship immediately? Immediately, they try to cover themselves up in front of each other. Immediately, what comes into their relationship is shame and blame. Shame and blame. And and I think for a lot of us, we would say like those are the chains that have held us back in our relationships. Shame and blame. Shame because of what I've said, because of what I've done. Blame because if you wouldn't have said what you said or did what you did, I wouldn't have said what I said or wouldn't have done what I did. Shame and blame immediately come into the scene and separate the two of them. They turn on each other. They start blaming each other. Before sin came into the world, there wasn't this kind of discord or jealousy or accusations. But when sin came, it brought offense. How could you? It brought sensitivity. I'm gonna stand up for myself. I'm gonna stand up for my rights. It, it, it brought disunity. It brought gossip. That sin didn't just separate us from ourselves. It separated us from each other. Put up this wall between the two of them and it's been doing it ever since. And, and so for some of us, like this describes our relational life. Like there are all these walls that separate us from the people around us because of the sin virus, shame and blame mark us. Third kind of death that Schaefer talks about is a physical separation or separation as we would think of it as uh, uh, from the body and soul. From the moment sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, they began to physically die. The Bible says in Genesis, if you eat of it, you'll surely die. But from the time they ate of it, they began to die. Their, their bodies were suddenly vulnerable to sickness and disease and physical pain and suffering, and they would eventually die a physical death. Fourth kind of separation the sin virus brought into our world was what he calls environmental separation, or I might just call it separation in creation. That, that creation was out of order. It's out of sync. God's creation isn't the way he originally designed it. Like there's some debate as to whether or not Um, There were cats before sin entered the world. I don't know if you know the, (laughs) but uh, the theological consensus is that there were cats before sin came into the world, but after sin came into the world, those cats became wild. That sin equals wild cats. Like that's the the equation that is mostly accepted. For those of you not watching in Kentucky and you don't understand. (laughs) From the moment sin entered the world, things have been out of balance. So we turn on the news and there are hurricanes and there are tornadoes and there are floods and fires and heat waves and cold snaps and the ground is contaminated and the water's polluted and The air is poisoned. Things are not the way God originally designed them. There's this environmental separation. Most, number five, most significantly, the sin virus resulted in what we could call spiritual separation. The separation between us and God. Here's what happens. Sin comes into the world and Adam and Eve's first response, they intuitively do it. No one told them to do it. Doesn't seem like they discussed it as a strategy, but they intuitively know I need to hide from God that this is what sin causes our souls to do. I need to hide from him. So the Bible describes this scene in Genesis where God comes to them after they sin to walk with them in the cool of the evening. Is that the way they did it? Was that a normal thing? I, I don't know, but he comes after they sin looking for them and they hide from him. And for some of you, this is what's happening right now in your spiritual life, whether you know it or not, whether you want it to be true or not. You've got this sin that is separating you from God and in your hiding from him, maybe you didn't make a conscious choice to do so, but that's what you're doing. Because in your mind you think, well, I can hold on to my anger and my bitterness and I can, I can be close to God at the same time and it doesn't work that way. You will find yourself hiding from him. I, I can pursue lust and chase pleasure and 
live this way and, and pursue God. I can, I can live with the spirit of greed in my life and selfishness and pride and, and I, I can be angry towards people, lash out at others, treat them poorly, and I'm good with God. I can still have this relationship with God. And for some of you, you've tried it and it has not worked because your soul knows to hide from him until that sin gets dealt with. It creates this separation between us and God, whether you want it to or not. And, and, and maybe you're aware of that separation, but in your mind, you're blaming God. You're saying, well, it's not me, it's, it's God who's moved. I, I read this uh, story out of a marriage book a number of years ago. I thought it was kind of a helpful illustration of this. The uh, couple had been married like 20 years. They were riding along in the husband's work truck that had a bench that goes across the, the front. He had trucks like this their whole marriage. And, and the wife was saying to him how things had changed and just wasn't like it used to be. And she said, don't you remember how it was in those early days of marriage where I'd sit in that middle seat and you'd put one arm around me and one hand on the steering wheel and we'd drive. And she said, look at us now. And she's up against the window of the other seat and, and he's driving. And he said to her, well, I'm not the one who moved, right? Like that was his <laughs> argument. I'm not the one who moved. I'm still in the same seat. This seat's still open. You're the one who moved, how he felt. In our relationship with God, what is true, he hasn't moved. He hasn't moved. And so if you are in a season where God just seems far from you and you feel spiritually distant from him, you're experiencing the separation of sin, know that he has not moved. His arm is still extended. But something has to be done about the sin. And so Paul explains that, that that sin of Adam created this separation and all of us have sinned. We've all, we've all personally ratified the sin of Adam. Verse 13 says, yes, people sinned even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any laws to break. So with Adam, God gave a very specific and explicit command, don't eat of the tree, here's the law. They broke that command. Death came, separation came. And then you have this time in history between Adam and Moses where there was no law and yet the people still experienced separation. They still experienced the death from the sin virus. And Paul says, look, the people who didn't have the law aren't judged the same way as those who got it because they didn't, they, they didn't sin as explicitly or as overtly as, as Adam or those after Moses. But Romans 1 says we're still held accountable. There's still um, in nature this moral, natural law that's built in. But it's not, it's not the same. The law was given, and, and now we know. We know that it's not just Adam who sinned, but we've, we've all fallen short of God's glory. We've all sinned. Still, everyone died. Even though not everyone sinned in the same way Adam did, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Verse 14 says, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. They still experienced the reality of the sin virus. They still experienced death. I love how the message paraphrases the end of verse 14. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who'll get us out of it. The moment sin entered the world, the Bible starts pointing us to Jesus. And so we have the first messianic prophecy in Genesis 3 that a savior would be born, that he would crush the head of the serpent Adam got us into it, but it's pointing to Jesus who'll get us out of it. Starting in verse 15, Paul's gonna compare the death that came through one man, Adam, with the life that comes through one man, Jesus. Verse 15, but there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gifts. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, but, don't miss this phrase, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. Even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness. And maybe this helps you understand the tension that I, I feel, I'm sure you do too, where you look around at the sin and the darkness of the world and you're like, it's just too much. There's just too much sin, there's too much darkness. And we pray for Israel, we pray for, for peace, we pray for the end of war, the end of violence, but it's just everywhere. The threat seems constant. And we see it in our own personal lives where we recognize sin, we said things, we 
never thought we'd say. We did things we never thought we'd do. And other people, and we realize what kind of evil really is represented in this world. And we think, well, maybe it's just too dark. Maybe it's just too evil. How, how can Jesus, this one man, pay for all that kind of sin? And Paul explains, this is how it works, that the virus of sin came through one man, Adam, and spread to everyone. The antidote or the cure for sin comes through one man, Jesus Christ, and is available to all who put their faith in him. What that means is, it does not matter how infected you are by the virus. It doesn't matter how far gone you are. If you are still living and breathing, there is hope for you. The, the antidote still works. And, and so for some of you, you feel like, you feel like you were from the beginning surrounded by this impossible situation, by the brokenness of others, by their sin and how it affected you, and it just, you never felt like you had a chance. And, but because of one man, Jesus, there is, there is a cure. That is the gospel, that through Jesus, his grace, verse 15 says, is, is even greater. It's even greater. So you might think to yourself, well, not after what I've done. Like even in this sense of, even as you're listening to this message, like this is what the enemy is trying to chain to your soul. That, hey, this is good and this is helpful for a lot of people, but he doesn't know what you did. And it's too late for you. That chain is, that chain is too heavy. It's too thick. Can't be broken. It's especially something we feel, I think, culturally these days because of the cancel culture approach of like, hey, you're, you're canceled. What you said, what you did, you're out. There's no coming back from that. And so we, we start to feel it on every side. And Paul says, no, look, even greater is his wonderful grace. Verse 16, and the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God. It leads to reconciliation, even though we're guilty of many sins. Verse 17, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater, there we go again, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners, but because the other person obeyed God, many will become righteous, many will be made righteous. And so what do you have here? You, you have Paul saying twice, even greater, verse 15, even greater is God's wonderful grace of grace and his gift of forgiveness, and then, Verse 17, even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. Here's how great God's grace is. It doesn't just forgive you, it makes you right. It doesn't just take care of the sin and the flaws and the stains, but it gives you the righteousness of Jesus. So his grace is even greater than whatever chain holds you back and, and so Paul compares and contrasts Adam and Jesus. A couple things here. First, Adam's sin results in separation, but the gift of Jesus brings reconciliation. So sin, the virus of sin, brings separation. It, it, it brings death. Separates us from ourselves, separates us from others. The story of sin is a story of separation. Here's how your sin has separated you from who God wanted you to be, how it separated you from the kind of relationships he wants you to have, and how it separated you from a relationship with your heavenly father. That is the story of sin. Sin is a separator, Jesus is a reconciler. He comes to reconcile what sin has separated. There's a beautiful picture of what this looks like when the temple was established. In the Old Testament, there was a, a room called uh, the Holy of Holies. And this was considered to be the earthly dwelling place of God's presence. And as you may know, only one person, the high priest, could enter into the Holy of Holies, and that could only be once a year on the day that they were making atonement for the sins of the people. One day a year, the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, but nobody else was allowed in God's presence. Here's how seriously they took it. On that day, when the, holy, or when the high priest went in there, they'd tie a rope around him just in case he died in there they could pull him out rather than someone else going in 
to the presence of God. That's how off limits his presence was. There was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. That curtain was 60 feet tall and was said to be four inches thick. 60 feet tall, four inches thick, nobody gets in here. This is where the presence of God dwells. You're not allowed. This curtain separates you from that. Here's what happened to the curtain on the night Jesus died. Matthew 27 tells us, verse 50, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, and at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, like a piece of paper. Top to bottom, nobody could have done that, but God, 60 feet long, four inches thick, and he rips it apart because he wants, he wants to walk with you. He, he wants to do life with you. Like Jesus came to reconcile us, and I, I don't know what sin has separated you from, from God, but that scene when Jesus died is this beautiful and dramatic picture of what, what God longs for. And, and that means that you have direct access to God. You don't need a priest and you don't need a pastor to serve as a mediator or as a way to get you access to God. I'm not necessary for that. You, you, Jesus died so you could have that kind of direct access. To, to live like that is not an incredible privilege is, a, is an insult to the sacrifice of Jesus, that the, the presence of God is available to us. And, and yet, for you know, I mean, I've got four hours of screen time on my phone, but the presence of God is gonna have to wait. And Jesus died so that we could experience the personal presence of God in our lives, that sin no longer had to separate us. And, and so the invitation is to move from regret to repentance. If you're carrying around a chain of regret, you move from regret to repentance and then from repentance to rejoicing because he sets you free. Secondly, Adam's sin results in condemnation, but the gift of Jesus brings justification. Verse 18 says that Jesus brings us into, quote, a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. He justifies us. He makes us right. And maybe you listen to this passage and you're like, hey, it just doesn't seem fair to me that because of one man's sin, I got this virus. And yeah, what Paul is making clear is that we've all sinned. We've all ratified his sin, meaning that if any of us were to have been in Adam's position, at some point, we would have done the same thing. At some point, we would have done the same thing. We, we've, all, we've all sinned. We can't make ourselves right, but, but Jesus, as reconciler, makes us right with God. I, I was visiting a man not long ago who um, knew he didn't have much time left, and he was trying to get things made right in his life. And he had some really beautiful examples of things he had done, just being intentional, and, and he had written letters to his daughter just asking for forgiveness and trying to own some things. He had written a, a letter to his ex-wife extending forgiveness and asking for forgiveness. And he, he, had, he had really worked hard at making sure all the finances were in order and he had next to him a folder with all the forms that needed to be filled out and, and here's how everything can be transferred over and he'd, he'd made sure everything was made right. But he said to me, I, I, just, I just wanna make sure I make myself right with God before I die. And I said, well, you can't do that. You cannot make yourself right with God. It, it doesn't matter how in order you get your paperwork. That's not what it's gonna get you. He's not gonna, when you get to heaven, he's not gonna say, let me, see, let me see the paperwork. Let me just make sure everything's in order. You can't make yourself right with God. But Jesus is our justifier and our reconciler He's the one who makes us right with God. So that chain that you've been carrying around, that I gotta make myself right with God chain, he breaks it. That chain that sometimes gets labeled as religion, he sets you free from that. That, that chain that is guilt and shame and you've gotta, you've gotta be good enough to make up for what you did, he sets you free from that burden. And for some of you, the, the chain you carry it's not that you gotta make yourself right, it's that you feel the weight of making somebody else right with God. But you are not the reconciler. 
I, I saw in the news yesterday, or excuse me, on Thursday, and um, there's a headline that said, mom deployed taser on teenage son to wake him up for church on Easter Sunday, court documents say. <laughs> Sharon Dobbins, age 40, was arrested on Sunday for using a taser on her 17-year-old son to make him wake up and get to Easter church services. There's two groups of people here. There are those of you who listen to that and you're like, that's horrible, I can't believe anybody would laugh at that. And then there are parents who've had a 17-year-old and you're like, hmm, wonder if that'll work. I obviously, obviously, probably not gonna create the heart for Jesus that you want in your child. <laughs> but I get it, like, you, you see the path that someone's on that you dearly love, and you see the separation that they're experiencing in their, their own souls, and the separation that's coming between you and them, and the separation between them and God, and you want them to be made right, and you're putting yourself in the place of Jesus, you're gonna be the one that makes them right and you're carrying that pressure, and that is, not your, that is not yours to carry. That is a chain that needs to be broken. Because you, in your arrogance and your pride, that I get is rooted in feelings of guilt and shame. You've convinced yourself, I've gotta, I've gotta fix them. I gotta make sure they get right with Jesus. That's on me. It's not on you. Now, there are things that you can do. Like, you, you can confess things and you can tell them I'm sorry I wasn't or I'm sorry I didn't and I know sometimes the example you saw wasn't like you, you can humble yourself but ultimately it is Jesus who reconciles and, and your child's only hope is in Jesus to rescue them it's, the only hope is in, in Jesus to heal them and to surrender their lives to him he is the one who makes us right we don't make ourselves right and we don't make other people right verse 20 God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were God's law is like this magnifying glass that shows you the reality of the situation you're in. That you've, oh, you've got it. You've got the sin virus, no doubt about it. My friend J.D. Greer explains it this way. He says, imagine you're sick with the flu and, and you don't know it's the flu and you're not ready to admit that it's the flu and admit that you're sick, but you know something is off. So you go to the doctor and the doctor says, thou shalt not run a temperature. Now, well, that's not very helpful Thou shalt not cough, thou shalt not have a sore throat, thou shalt not sneeze. And he keeps giving you these commands, but the commands do nothing to cure you. But they do reveal that you need a cure. Like the more those commands come, the more you realize, I can't keep these commands. I've got the virus, I need an antidote. And so the law reveals to us the reality of our sickness and our need for a savior. Verse 20, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules. God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Again and again in these verses, the emphasis is on not not the weight of your sin, but the wonder of God's grace. Verse 15, even greater is God's wonderful grace. Verse 17, even greater is God's wonderful grace. Verse 20, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. Verse 21, God's wonderful grace rules. It's as if Paul knows, oh, they're, they're gonna need to hear this more than once. It's as if he knows you're not just chained by one chain, you've got three or four that are holding you back. And if you wanna be set free from your past, maybe something that you did or something that's been done to you, your confidence and your hope is in the chain breaker. It's in the grace of Jesus and the fact that it is greater. And I know some of you, you would do, you would do anything to take back what you said or what you did. You would do anything to undo the hurt and the damage, the separation that has been caused because of your sin. I know for some of you, like it's so hard to even think about what you're pulling around behind you that you just are angry because you can't deal with it any other way. But Romans makes it clear that no matter how great your chain, that even greater is God's wonderful grace. 
no matter what, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter what you're going through, God's grace, Paul says, is even greater. His grace is greater than the diagnosis you were given. His grace is greater than the bitterness that you carry, the secrets that you've kept, the addiction that you've battled. Even greater is his wonderful grace. No matter how far you've fallen, no matter how often you've failed, God's grace is greater. And you can say to yourself, and maybe this is what you're saying to yourself, well, not, not after what I did. Some things can't be undone. I crossed a line, there, there's no going back. But grace is even greater because it's not based on what you did, it's based on what's been done for you. That means you may have dropped out or you may have been kicked out or you may have got knocked down or been locked up. You may have been cheated on or you may have cheated, but the most important thing about you is that no matter what, God's grace in your life is even greater. His grace is powerful enough to erase your guilt. His grace is big enough to cover your shame. His grace is sure enough to hold you up. It's real enough to heal your relationships. His grace is healing enough to cure your bitterness. His grace is sufficient enough to deal with your disappointment. His, his grace is beautiful enough to redeem your brokenness. His grace is strong enough to break your chains. And you, you may have given up on grace, but let me tell you, grace has not given up on you. And here's how I know that, is that you're listening to this right now. Amen. That you're listening to this right now it tells me everything I need to know about what God's grace is trying to do in your life. He wants you to be set free from those chains that you've carried. His grace chases you down. His grace will help you up. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what chains are holding you back, even greater is God's wonderful grace. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are the chain breaker. I know that you know, in, a, in a message like this, when we talk about being set free from our past, there's part of us that wants like a list. Like what are the four things I need to do to, and we wanna add a chain of pressure, of pride, like I'm the one who did it. But God, I pray that you would allow us to experience supernatural breakthrough. I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would break through some strongholds that you, Jesus, our chain breaker, would set us free. That this church would be a place of freedom, that this would not be a cancel culture church, but it would be a cross culture church where under your cross, we celebrate freedom. That we don't put on each other the chains of guilt and shame and bitterness, but that we, we receive it freely from you and we give it freely to one another because it is our only hope. It's in your name we pray, amen.